good afternoon. I am the general chair of ICC 2019. My name is Dr. Anirban Sengupta. I'm associate professor at Indian Institute of Technology Indore. It's my pleasure to have uh, Dr. Martin G. Kinsley from IBM Research. So uh, he's our keynote speaker today. So hi, Martin. There's a few questions I have. For hi, Anirban. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. So my first question is, it was first of all very interesting keynote talk that we had. So what do you see is the role of brain-inspired uh, computing for IBM right now? Uh, for us, it's actually one of, the important, um, one of the important architectures that we need to get into what I call broad AI. Broad AI, as I uh, try to explain, is when you have multiple data streams and when you need to process them to create the specific context of an action. Today, much of uh, the use, what we call narrow AI, is simply to create digital insight that is actually do speech recognition. But as you perform actions, those actions usually are in a specific context, specific place, specific time, specific situation. So in order to get that right, you need actually a lot of inputs. You need to understand the context. You have a lot of data sources. And we're seeing now that only with these brain-inspired uh, architectures will we get there uh, to use those to essentially come to conclusions in a really rational manner with a rational amount of time and also uh, at the edge because obviously uh, those brain-inspired computing architectures have a much, much lower power consumption than uh, the uh, equivalent for Neumann architectures which would require more power, more space, etc. So in a sense you can say that the brain-inspired computing architecture help us to expand sort of Moore's law beyond what raw physics can actually do because raw physics, you know, we're sitting at seven or four nanometers and it's not going to go beyond that. Right, so technically speaking, if you have to make a differentiation between bio-inspired computing versus brain-inspired computing. How would you define that? I think they're probably pretty much, uh, pretty much the same. That is, brain-inspired computing is just, uh, in a sense, a name for architecture that works with neurons and synaptic, in, uh, synapses. That is, it is a different way to process, it's a different way to process signals. Right. Now, if you want to go beyond it with a bio, um, that actually, we were looking at uh, you know, the digital nose and the digital tongue, so to speak. Right. Um, and in order for, for those, then you need different kinds of sensors. So say brain-inspired computing is the computing architecture they use to process it. But before you get there, you actually need to have an entirely new array of sensors to get all of those other, uh, to, uh, to get the proper input as I said, you know, for, uh, you know, smells that is, you know, whatever is in the air, and also then for, uh, you, know, for you know, for liquids, obviously there are other kinds of uh, inputs, you know, haptic, uh, pressure, sensors, flows, etc. And for those, actually, then you need different kinds of sensors. And in a sense, you can say, you know, bio-inspired computing will have both brain-inspired processing, but then also an entirely sort of a new and expanded set of sensors actually to feed you with the right context. So if you're talking about sensors and bio-inspired computing together at the same time, can we apply this to IoT, Internet of Things? Uh, I think ultimately this is where Internet of Things is going. That is, uh, if you look, uh, you know, for instance, uh, maybe it's not necessarily only things, it's Internet let's say, of a lot of things, including, you know, in, in, uh, you know including, including people. But, for instance, if you look at, uh, you know, the uh, cognizant, if you look at, uh, you, know, the, uh, you, know, the sense, you know, the sense of smell, right. you would actually use that, for instance, let's say, in, uh, in an oil refinery right. or chemical plants where you need to determine whether there are any noxious, uh, lethal, or otherwise undesired gases. Correct. And so is that, that's part of the that's Internet of things. things right. And so it's simply expanding beyond you know, the standard right now. Most of the inputs for the Internet of Things today 
are uh, visual, that is video and image, right. and uh, audio acoustic. But we feel that even in the industrial space for Internet of, uh, Internet of Things, you know, as I say, you know, if you look at um, what's called the hyper taste, a lot of those sensors were actually was really like industrial fluids where you would uh, determine what the composition of that is. And so, in a sense, for us at least, we look at that as part of the Internet of Things. Okay, okay so that's very good to know. Uh, apart from that, from the IBM's perspective, if you're talking about machine learning, so how is, how is IBM going to look at uh, the machine learning aspect, whether it's supervised machine learning or unsupervised machine learning? Which one does IBM look at? Um, in a, I think you cannot do one without the other. Right. Uh, in many cases, you need to start with supervised, that is, you actually need to have labeled, um, labeled data sets. Right. However, uh, simply because there is so much work for labeled data sets, it's not sufficient. And so we're looking at, for instance, uh, things are called transfer learning, mm -hmm. where you can then have insights that you gained from labeled data sets and expand it into domains that are neighboring, but where you actually can do it on your own. Right. On the other hand, we're also working on autocoders mm -hmm. that are simply looking at uh, data and then find out what are the clusters of outputs. And then once you have those, you can identify those with, with specific meanings. So we're not doing one or the other. We believe that the field actually needs all of them uh, together. On the other hand, the less labeling is needed, the more progress we're going to make simply because labeling is a lot of work. That's true, that's true. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Martin. It was great talking to you. Well, and thank you for thank giving you the Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity thank to you. be here. Thank you so much.